so so um again welcoming you i'm seeing a lot of you putting things in the chat and we're like you know nebraska oklahoma virginia maryland arizona um westchester pa which is where I was just this past weekend. So just saying, small world, um, Indianapolis, Illinois. So it's so it's always so exciting for us when we do these webinars to realize that this is part of a nationwide movement. We're all in this together. Um, and so welcome to all of you for joining uh, us today. I'm Kay Mojer McDivitt. I'm a senior technical assistant specialist with the National Alliance on Homelessness. I'm joined by my colleague, Josh. Josh, do you wanna introduce yourself? Yes, thank you so much, Kay. Welcome. This is actually um, my, one of my, I'm, I'm new to the, the Alliance. I'm Josh Johnson. Uh, I go by he, him, his pronoun. So it is, I'm really excited to be here and see all the great representation from around the, uh, around the country. So I'll pass it back to you, Kay. All right. Thank you, Josh. And we're super excited to have Josh. So just a few housekeeping notes. Um, so uh, you guys are all muted. This is, you know, you all know that, right? So use the chat box. So we're going to encourage you to use the chat box to share any information or ideas you have. If there's something you're doing um, that we're talking about and you go, hey, you know, in Omaha, Nebraska, we're doing this. Um, it's a way to dialogue with everyone on here. Um, we also have two of our colleagues um, that are in the background. They're going to be keeping an eye on Slack. They're going to be putting some resources in there if there's a specific um, issue that comes up and there's a resource that we think could be helpful to you. Both um, I, Mia and Christy, our colleagues with the capacity building team, are on the webinar as well, monitoring the chat. We just want to remind you, we are not HUD. This is not a HUD webinar. So our, you know, if there's specific questions having to do with the NOFO or a continuum of care application or any of those things, you need to direct those um, that information to HUD um, and not to us. Um, and you already heard, those of you that have been on for a little bit, the webinar is being recorded. Um, we will be posting all of, all of these materials, the webinar, the slides will be posted on our website for our system series. So before we get started, we're just really curious. We're seeing that you guys are here from all over the country, but super, super curious to see exactly what you do and who you are. So Josh just launched a poll. So just take some time and you can answer more than one, right? So if you're, you know, if you do rapid rehousing and emergency shelter, you can put multiple things in. So please enter what describes who you are. All right, we'll give about two more seconds. We have about 80% of folks answer. And if you see, if you don't, if you don't see, you know, maybe what you classify yourself as, you can go ahead and put it in the chat as well. Um, all right, I'm gonna end it now. So we have almost 83% of you have answered. We'll give you just another minute. We still have some people that have been joining. Um, so some of you, some folks are putting it in. I see that. Um, so you guys are putting some of those extra things in um, chat. So thanks for doing that. So you know what, Josh, I haven't seen any more come in. Why don't we just close out the poll? Yep, all right, I'm sharing it now. So you can see, um, pretty cool, right? Um, a variety of things that we're doing. Um, we have, and th you know, what's so great is that we have persons with lived expertise that are part of our meeting today. And we, we, we want to keep learning from you and have you involved in what we do. So thank you so much for joining. Um, about the highest percent are folks that are grantees that um, are continuum of care grantees. Um, we also then um, the next closest one is also continuum of care membership, either board members, collaborative applicants. But then we have other folks. We have providers, both in emergency shelter, rapid rehousing, PSH, and we have funders, technical assistance providers. So lots of different roles that we play. Um, and so hopefully 
for wherever you're coming from, you will glean some information that could help you understand a little bit more about a system and how to be really thinking proactively about any funding. Um, and then, you know, specifically as you're going into the NOFO. So we'll stop sharing that poll. All right. So here's what we're hoping that you come out of today. So um, Josh is going to provide a basic overview of the goals and characteristics of an effective homeless response system. Um, we're going to also then be talking about how you can use that approach in making decisions on, on, on how you develop partnerships and um, have an impact on reducing homelessness. We're also going to talk about in, um, evaluating your community investments. And then finally, we're going to talk about how you can use the upcoming um, continuum when it um, process, what it is released to further those goals. So we told you there's a uh, system series. This is the page for the system series. Um, we're in chat, hopefully, um, we're going to be getting up a link so that you could actually link to the system series and you can see a number of tools that are going to be there. We're also going to be having, um, that's where we're going to post this. And moving forward, you can see some of the next um, webinars that are going to be coming up that will complement and support this webinar as well. So why did we decide to do a system series? So I don't know how many of you remember, but we launched the system series back in 2019 um, and launched it again prior to the NOFO. We're talking about the system series and put out some resources. And then like all of us, we quickly pivoted um, when we hit early 2020 and, and pivoted to a response um, to the outbreak of the pandemic. And so, we are now, like many of us again are doing, are coming around to going, okay, let's get back to some of those things that can help us move forward. We've learned so much during the pandemic. And so everything that we do at the Alliance and everything that you're doing is really built on new things that we've learned as a result of the last couple of years. So why are we doing the series, right? So you guys are working with communities with very challenging housing crises coupled with the pandemic, right? Given. So it was hard before, it's been even harder in the last two years. And then again, you have people that are in urgent crisis, multiple housing barriers, um, multiple, um, multiple, well, I shouldn't have said multiple, but affected by uh, trauma and and affected by all kinds of things that are happening in their lives in regards to the economy and to their housing. And then we have to navigate this current housing challenging market, right? Or challenging housing market. We knew that the market's been challenging, right? It's not been what we wanted it for a long time, but in the last year, I think it's, we will all agree it's gotten even worse. So no matter where we are, no matter West Coast, East Coast, you know, the, the Southern part of the country, the Northern part of the country, the, you know, the middle of the country, we are facing one of the hugest housing crises we've ever had um, in terms of the challenging housing market. So, you know, we're looking for ways that we can address that and ways that we can improve our outcomes. We want, we know that you guys want to strengthen your homeless response system. And finally, you know, we know that you want to understand what makes your system effective, efficient, and equitable, and then how you're going to identify your strengths and then your gaps. And then how do you utilize whatever resources are out there? And we know that they're scarce and we know that there's not enough of anything. So how do we make sure that with what we have, we are using it in the most effective, efficient, and equitable, equitable way possible? So I am now going to turn this over to Josh. Well, thank you so much, Kay. And I want to start by apologizing. For some reason, our closed caption button is not working. So um, we will ensure that this is recorded and we'll uh, be able to turn the closed caption on for the for the recorded portion of of this of this training. So again, I'm, just for a second introduction, I'm Josh Johnson. Um, so I, I'm, I'm tasked with just talking about what what it means and what it is, what a homeless response uh, that is effective, efficient, equitable. Uh, what it, what does it look like, right? And what is it supposed to do? So and also as I talk about uh, this system uh, and how does the the NOFO help uh, build. The, the system that I'm going to outline. 
And then also we'll talk about why it's not important to wait for the NOFO to drop and why it should be a year long process of continue, continually um, improving um, our systems. And again, around those three E's, and you'll, you'll, that'll be kind of a common theme during my part is just talking about the three E's, effective, efficient, and equitable. So on the next slide, we'll kind of define that out a little bit, right? So, so again, um, a, a homeless system that has all the three E's, right, is one that has that has all the uh, components aligned in a way that all the interventions are sh and goals are designed to help people either not enter the homeless system whenever safely possible, and that could be by diversion or, or prevention. Um, and if they enter the system, then we help them exit as quickly as possible into permanent, uh, safe, and stable housing. Communities who have who've, who've shown the, who have proven this um, have had uh, a housing first uh, uh, approaches entrenched into the system, um, evident by their focus on helping um, individuals with live, uh, helping individuals experiencing homelessness move into housing, and then pri providing the uh, other necessary supports once they're housed. This has been proven to get better results when done correctly. Um, use use less resources when 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 done um, uh, effective and efficiently, and lessen the potential traumatic exposure related to the home, someone's home, homeless uh, experience. So the approach, right? So what is the approach uh, of the homeless response system? Again, it's an effective system. We have uh, not only designed all of our programs and model around that the goal of of, of quickly housing folks. But the whole system approaches ensures that the resources and program align roles and activities around the central goal around equitably rehousing people quickly. So where do we start, right, by designing this system? Well, you want to start with the end game in mind, right? So what is the end game? We want the goal of our system is to make sure homelessness is rare, brief, and one time. So. When people are in a housing crisis, they have access to immediate help, including a safe place to go. People are not unsheltered, so our policies, our procedures are not creating barriers that could be in shelters, that can be, could be in our outreach approaches. Where our goal is to ensure folks are unsheltered in our communities. People do not spend long term, long uh, periods of time in homelessness. People exit homeless homelessness quickly and do not quickly cycle back into homelessness. And really looking at the uh, interventions and the uh, the uh, services that we provide while they're in our in our uh, system. We also want to establish uh, system performance measures, right? And we'll put that we'll put HUD's um, system performance measure measure guidance in the chat. But we want to make sure that we have um, measures that ensure that we re we're reducing uh, inflow into homelessness. Increase, we're increasing exit to permanent housing. We're decreasing average length of, length of stays in, in homelessness. And we're decreasing returns to homelessness, right? If we don't have those, those uh, measures in place, that's where we definitely we need, we need to start. We wanna ensure that there are standards that are implemented across all programs, right? We wanna ensure that all programs within our system have equity as the foundation that ensures that all folks uh, who are in the in the homeless system uh, are served equitably and, and have a safe and stable stable home. We want to ensure housing first is 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 entrenched in all of all parts of our system. We want to ensure, ensure that we have diversion when folks are at imminent risk of homelessness or are, act, are attempting to access the homeless system. We're having those safe and appropriate conversations to. Uh, identify um, what's what is the best step for their for their housing crisis. We want to rapidly identify and engage people who are unsheltered to hopefully connect them to the, to uh, services and housing assistance. We also want to ensure that our programs uh, access to our programs are quick. There are low barriers uh, to to shelters and other programs other programs, and and. Folks who are specifically in shelters, as short stays as possible, right? Because we're really our goal is to get folks housed quickly. We also want to ensure that we have rapid connection to permanent housing for all sheltered and unsheltered folks. So, 
So this is a really, a really great slide around looking at our system flow. So asking the question, is our system, is our system, system efficient? Is it coordinated? Is it, is it aligned in a way that folks who enter the system have a, a, a flow to, to uh, accessing uh, housing? Are there, are, are, are there um, issues around the flow uh, of the, uh, this, as this roundabout, for, ex for example? So ima imagine this roundabout. If this car, if one of the cars stops uh, in this roundabout, right, then the whole, the whole flow of the roundabout will stop. So why, why this is important is because a lot of times when we look at our systems, we see that there is bottlenecks, there's wait lists, there's um, you know, not enough shelter beds. And what we do is without looking at the system in whole, we make a decision based off of the effect of not having a, a smooth flow within our systems. Instead of looking at, well, is there a car or is there a, a, a program not moving, moving things um, in, in the way we, our system is designed to go, right? So again, when we're making decisions specifically around funding, around um, um, what, what our system needs, we have to look at it from the system, uh, the system view, right? And not just, we have a problem and not, and not really diving deeper into the root causes of that issue, which is uh, how do we improve the system flow? And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next, next few slides. So for this one, what are some what are some of the signs that your system is stuck, right? That there's not a, a flow happening. Um, and so I want I, I want you all in the chat as while I'm while I'm, I'm saying some of these, put some of the things that you you all think. What are some what are some things that you think would would demonstrate a system not having a adequate flow of meeting the needs of folks who are experiencing homelessness and ensuring that they have access in, in, a, in a timely manner to housing. And I see some in the chat already. I appreciate that. I appreciate you all. Um, so unchanging or increasing number of unsheltered people. Wait list for shelter. Long length of stay in shelter, more than, uh, more than 30 days. High percentage of exits from shelter to homelessness. Average length of homelessness is not decreasing. Inflow into homelessness is steady or increasing. Long wait lists for wrap rehousing PSH. Significant amount of people who are, are getting are, aren't getting any kind of assistance, right? So these are potential signs of a system having having um, having a issue with flow. So again, on that, thinking about that last slide, if you are to make decisions that are impacting the system. And you're making a decision based off of some of these some of these issues that arise from a lack of flow. You might be putting in an intervention that really doesn't improve the the flow of the uh, of your system, but only meets the need of of, of a of a, a issue that that only arose because of of, of the flow. And I'm, I'm looking at these great um, great answers and responses in in the chat. They came in so quick. I, I think it was 80 of them, so I didn't <laughs> was able to see all of them. But I definitely I appreciate you all for, for sharing. Um, we're going to launch a poll, right? Does your community have the elements of an effective, efficient, and equitable system? Right. Just this is based off your based off what we said, and also based off just your 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 understanding. All right, so about well, 50, while Josh and I are waiting, I'm, I'm going to say that we can see this in real time. And so, you know, if you see us sort of smiling, it's just interesting to see what your responses are. I'm going to give about five more seconds. We have about 65% of folks who have responded. Starting to slow down. And then it picks up again. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to share the results. So 13% say yes, we have it. We got it. We got it. We got it. Um, got it mastered. That's amazing. 64% um, say, hey, we're getting there slowly but surely. Um, 3% I have no idea, 
A um, little under 20% said not even close. Okay. Well, I think, again, it's really important to know where you're at, to know, to know what you need to do, right? Um, so I appreciate you all, you all's honest, honesty with, with filling out this poll. And that, that, um, that's, that's really great. And, and Josh, I'm just going to add that somebody said in chat, and I think, you know, that um, now it, it's going so fast that I had a hard time. It went past me already, but it said, you know, we've got all the elements, but we're really struggling, you know, with staffing and we're on the verge of collapse with staffing. And so, you know, we want to recognize that we know that there's been a ton of challenges um, in the last two years, it's not just on the health side, but also just on our capacity side as well. So um, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for uh, highlighting that, that Kay. And I, I'm gonna, I don't think anybody put this in the chat, but I'm gonna put the, the, the performance measures that I highlighted a couple slides ago in the chat. All right. All right, so I appreciate you all doing that poll. So on, so we're gonna make a little bit of a transition. I just wanted to uh, level set of what, when we say an, an effective, efficient and equitable system, what we're talking about. We're, again, we were talking about the flow. We're talking about the everybody in the system is aligned, right? And I saw in the chat a little bit, there, there definitely that doesn't alleviate any, any of the challenges, right? Affordable housing is absolutely a challenge. Um, a lot of the other things that uh, what folks mentioned, absolutely, there are challenges, but we're really just talking, we're talking about the flow of the system and how it's designed and how, and how, and again, thinking about that roundabout, right? There's, there could be things that have, that impede the flow of, of the roundabout. But again, you want to make sure that people, the, the ultimate goal is for it to run smoothly and for people to go in and out. And all of our, all of our tools and all of our um, um, resources are going towards that direction. So how to build a better system. Um, again, we're gonna, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time just talking about reallocating and investing, investing resources to create flow and get better outcomes. So we wanna start by right-sizing your system, um, invest resources to get better outcomes, right? We, again, we talked about aligning all of our resources to improve our system outcomes. Again, NOFO is one piece of this funding alignment. And again, we're, we're, we're encouraging you to be working on this and looking at this throughout the year and not just when the NOFO happens. But again, NOFO is a, good op a great opportunity to align resources to improve the system, system um, outcomes and flow. We also want to look at ways to reallocate to, to improve the system flow and outcome, right? And again, looking at it from the system viewpoint and not, even, not just from, you know, we have a... Uh, we have an increase, an increased amount of folks who are unsheltered, and, and the, the the quick response might might be right. Um, we need to build more shelters, right? Instead of well, maybe let's look at how folks are exiting out of shelter into permanent housing. Let's look at let's look at is there is there more wrapper housing needed in our community, right? So we want to, when we build the capacity, we want to do do so with intentionality. We want to use our data. We want to, what what does our our HIC tell us? What 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 does that that system view look like? What what is what is the, uh, in most need with within our community, right? And again, looking at it from that that big picture standpoint. So some of the questions you want to ask when right sizing your your system, right? You know, one right. Just generally, how is your 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 local um, system performing? How are programs performing in relation to the system's goals? What does your data tell you about gaps and resources? And what should you make and in, make investments towards? What specific problems do you want your dollars to solve? What are the most effective ways to achieve that goal? And it, again, it may not be what you think, right? What are the consequences across the system of one agency's funding decision? Right. So this is and so this that that last question I left with. It, so the funding decisions they have they have impact. And on the next slide, you know, we'll, we'll talk about what are some of the possible results of investing across the system um, that that sometimes folks might not think about. Right. So we if we expand a version we potentially might free up shelter capacity, right? When we expand shelter, what might end up happening is we have more sheltered folks, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean we're making a dent in, in homelessness. 
But without investments, in, if we do this without investments in really in housing uh, strategies, um, there will be no overall reduction, right? So just think about what are some of those when we make the decisions. So if we expand rapid rehousing, we might expedite outflow from shelter and re uh, reduce strain on shelter capacity. But again, a a in the chat, I I I've seen it mentioned, you know, this has to be, there has to be priority on housing identification and housing st stabilization. It's, and this can't be just, um, you know, a, a part of somebody's, you know, already uh, burdened role, right? This has to be some intentionality around how really exhausting and expanding the role of housing identification as, as a priority with rapid rehousing. So, uh, and then if you make the decision to expand PSH, which reduces portion of chronic the chronic population, right? Um, and with the, so, uh, but this may not be uh, this may not be no discern, discernible impact on with the later years without investment on addressing inflow in the homelessness, right? So, if we invest in PSH, you know that 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 will be that would re greatly reduce chronic homelessness, right? Uh, if if we but also is it might not do anything with the inflow or flow out for uh, out of shelter if we don't have the necessary rapid housing um, um, resources. And I, I think I skipped over this, sorry, I was uh, jumping around, but expanding THRH as temporary housing capacity and housing exit strategies. And, then, uh, and, and on the other end, right, decreasing our, um, uh, for, for example, rapid housing could have impact as well, right? If you if you re reduce the rapid housing in your community, you might impact the, the um, the, the outflow of your shelter, and, and you could even potentially increase the chronic population. So in decisions that you have on your system really have impact. And if you're not using that big picture system flow uh, viewpoint with, with making these decisions, you can have some unintentional impacts that really will uh, uh, affect the most vulnerable in our community. So I think this next slide really captures that. So if you make investments without that, that, that system view, you will just have a, a potentially a lot of great programs, a lot of programs in your community, but they will be in no order, right? There will be no flow to, to these, these resources. So it's really important to be intentional with, with the decisions we make and make sure that they all, they all fit together to really meet the goal of ending homelessness and make, again, making homelessness rare, brief, and one time. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to Kay, who's really going to tie in how, how the NOFO can really help with this with this process. Thanks so much, Josh. And, you know, um, I turned my camera off, but you, you know, I'm sitting here like smiling as I think about this, because I remember when, you know, I worked in a community and, and did the work of looking at fund, you know, how we were going to spend funding in our community, you know, whether it was through the, what we were calling the NOFA at the time, not the NOFO. Um, it, yeah. We talked about that last year, right? We switched up the name from NOFA to NOFO. Um, but also, and, and just remembering how so often, you, you know, we just weren't purposeful. We didn't ask ourselves these questions and, and how much I wish, and I, we would have known this um, a long time ago, the kinds of things that we just talked about. And I think, you know, we're going through this and, you know, a lot of people in chat have been saying, you know, are, are you know, are you, we going to have access to these slides and the webinar? And the answer is yes, because I do know that we go through this quickly we have an hour today um but it takes some time to think about it and it's even the kinds of things that you know maybe sharing with your governance board or your decision making board some of the things that we talked about um so that they can better understand that you know it's not just always business as usual or rubber stamping what we've done in the past but it's constantly looking to how we can improve our system and you know, we used to talk about an effective system, but it's also about being efficient as well. And then Josh also talked about being equitable in everything we do. Um, we are aware now um, in the last couple of years that our system hasn't been equitable. And so how do we make it equitable? So in preparing for the NOFO. So by the way, see this little um, line on here, check out the lion checklist. I was gonna put a bunch of check marks on there, but um, we're gonna uh, pop uh, a link in the, in the chat to that um, particular tool. The Alliance has um, a, like a checklist of things that, and, and what I'm gonna talk about now is gonna sort of follow that checklist, but that checklist goes even to, into more depth. And if, if nothing else out of this entire um, webinar today is, pull down that checklist. And as a planning 
um, committee, as a planning governance board, as a, a planning community, take a look at that list and start going through it because preparation, we always say no full preparation should be happening all year long. You should not be waiting until the notices start coming out because you know the minute you submit is submitted the 2021 NOFO should have been the first day of planning for the 2022 NOFO. Um, what is it that you wrote in your proposal? What is it that you want to do? How are programs doing? And it's and really start like today, even thinking about this is getting ready for this NOFO. But what are we going to do as soon as we push that submit button to make sure that we're in a great place of being prepared for the next NOFO? All right. So, um, learn from the past and prepare for the future, right? So what can we learn? And I know that, um, uh, uh, you know, hopefully a lot of you were in the HUD debrief and, and you, you got your scores, you got your debriefing. And I understand I was not on that in that uh, meeting, but I understand it was a fairly robust chat discussion going on and a fairly um, robust and active um, meeting and webinar that happened around that. But really look at your own, like review what you got, read what you wrote, look at your score debrief. Where did you score well? Where didn't you score well? Also, make a list of all the things, like go through that entire application. And I remember when I did that application, you know, and you, you'd see the question and you'd think about what you were going to say. But, you know, but then it was sort of like, I, and I remember one time after we submitted it, you know, I said to our committee, you know, y'all, like we have to really think about it because there was a lot of things that we knew that HUD was looking for, but we also knew not only was HUD looking for them, they were the right things to do, but we've got to be really strategic to make sure now that we do what we said we're going to do. So really make a checklist of those activities. This is your own checklist, right? What is it that you said throughout that whole NOFA that you were going to do? Um, and then what is also the data and the information that stakeholders said they were going to do? Like, where are we? And start looking at that now. And then like, look at the areas. Where did you not get your match, maximum number of points in the application? And this is not as much about how you write it, but it's about what you're doing. Um, and so what is it that, you know, if you didn't get the maximum number of applications in a certain area or a maximum number of points on your application in a certain area, take a pause, read through it, read the question again, read the guidance that came last year and think about what could we do better as a continuum to improve on this and then start prioritizing and plan to address those areas. Are there some things that you can do that would make that you make in your funding decisions that you could say in this application, we're maybe, you know, reallocating or we're expanding or we're adding in this area so that we can better address this issue that we have, whether it's your data, you know, whether it's, a, you know, uh, like a system, whether it's about, you know, what you have in your system all of that, really be strategic about it. And then develop a plan. So you take a look at it and develop a plan. Start meeting, meeting with your local providers. If you've already decided after you look at this that you may be changing some things, um, you may be prioritizing things differently, um, you're gonna be looking more critically at the programs you're currently funding to make sure that they really are having the impact that you need them to have in your system. When I do rapid housing training, for example, <clears throat> I often say that you can, you know, a rapid housing provider can like, you know, say, okay, you know, um, we have this money and we said we're going to accomplish and have this many people and, and you know, accomplish these goals. And, and say you say that you apply for a, you know, a, a mid-sized program. So, you know, somebody's going to get assistance for 12 months to 18 months. And we're going to serve 20 people. And, and we absolutely do exactly what we said we're going to do. But did that have an impact on the system? Did we see that we were housing people that maybe were more vulnerable so that we could shorten lights of stay? Were we make, because well run rapid rehousing programs, well run PSH programs, well run coordinated entry should have a, an impact on your overarching system outcomes. So program outcomes can look good, but if there's not an impact on your larger system outcomes, step back 
and think about that and then start talking to your providers, you know, because maybe there's another provider that got the same amount of funding and said they'd serve the same number of people, but they actually were able because they were very efficient um, and, and, and effective with a program. And they really took equity into account that they, they made a huge difference um, in the, some of the, the racial inequities in the system. They, there was a bigger difference in the number of people that were in the house more quickly. That's what you want, right? You know, two providers can be doing the same thing, but you know, you guys as providers, you know, don't compete with each other's providers. Come together and say, how do I, how can I learn from you if I didn't do as well so that I can beef up what I'm doing and see this as a partnership, right? And then really look at your review and ranking tool. Like, and, and so like based on your scoring, but also whatever the HUD priorities that come out. Now, you know what the HUD priorities were last year. I, and remember you send your scoring tool in. And one of the things that we know from, you know, some communities that we worked with and, you know, have worked with in the past is that, you know, sometimes, you know, we've established a rank, a review and ranking tool. And it was like, like top notch, like five, six years ago, we're going, we've got this best tool, right? But now we look at the HUD priorities and HUD is asking for things about people with lived experience and, and HUD might be asking for things about your racial you know, inequities and, and some partnerships, You know, what the priorities are. And they will be very clear on what those priorities are at the beginning. Look at those priorities and update your score, your score uh, tool, your ranking tool, your review tool to align with that. And then making sure that the providers know these are things you need to have as part of your applications, even if it's a renewal, is that maybe you haven't been focused on the inequities in the system, but we're asking all of our providers now to do that. Maybe you have not been inclusive of people with lived expertise, and that's something we you really need to do. This is not a token person that maybe was homeless eight years ago and sits on a committee, but are we actively engaging in our in our planning and our preparation to do that? Also, and then you're going to see making sure this little bullet down there ensure that the committee is a diverse group of people that represents what your community looks like. Your committee should look like your homeless system. It should look like your homeless community, just like your organizations should look like the people that they serve. Make sure that your request for proposals are aligned not only with the HUD priorities, but with the specific needs of your community. We see a lot of times communities will say like, okay, you know, we're accepting proposals for permanent, permanent housing projects and not being specific about what it is. And then, you know, so if what you need is more rapid rehousing for individuals, be specific. We are, we are putting out requests for proposals for, for rapid rehousing for single individuals. Be that's what you want to do, not just because, you know, it's out there that you're putting out there, but be very concise and asking for what proposals you need. Um, and then I guess I said this again, right, but also look at a reallocation, right, making sure that you're providing um, the guidance also on addressing racial disparities. So you want to be very purposeful and specific about that in your request for proposals, right? And that's both for you know new projects and if you're gonna take some money and reallocate a project, that's what you wanna really look for. Be very purposeful in what you do. do you, I like that word, can you tell? Purposeful. Just because it's an eligible activity, right? HUD says these are the eligible activities. Just because it's an eligible activity doesn't mean it's a priority for your community. It doesn't mean that you have to fund it even if it aligns with what's allowable your community, the whole point of choosing and ranking and tier one and tier two is what is it that our community needs? All that stuff Josh just talked about, go back and look at that. What do we need to make all of that happen? And again, in the learning from the past and preparing for the future, begin reviewing your renewal projects. And I know, re, I, I get that reallocation, especially, and if I would be a provider, I get it. Like, you know, I reallocation feels really scary. It feels scary for providers. It also feels scary for continuums that have relationships with providers. But this cannot be business as usual. We have to consistently look at what, okay, where are we getting the biggest bang for our buck? I mean, that's what it comes down to. Um, but what that means is the biggest bang for our buck is human. It, it, it's on the humanity side of where are we going to be able to have the biggest impact on every person, every one of our neighbors that is unhoused? What is it that we need to do to make that 
make that happen. And that's where your focus needs to be. The focus of every decision you make is not on the providers, not on our partners. Is every partnership, everything we do has to be focused on each individual person, our neighbors, who should not be living without housing, right? No one should be homeless in your community. So shifting that focus and being very laser focused on, yes, this program has gotten this money for a long time. And yes, they've been meeting the basics, but what could we do perhaps differently? Is there a better resource, a better way to use these funds um, that, that a project that might not be, you know, being as effective and efficient and equitable. And how are we going to make sure that happens? So I ask this, like what's underutilizing or underperforming? That's the first place to start looking. And again, what I was just talking about, what program has the most significant impact on improving your system outcomes? Are the programs aligning and furthering our work on decreasing racial disparity? And if that's not a clear focus of what that, that program is doing that's been funded in the past, consider reallocation to an organization that is going to align on, on furthering your work on racial disparity. Um, let's look at underspent. We don't want to ever see you all send money back to HUD, right? Because that's money you're never going to get back, right? It also, it's also part of the whole evaluation process, you know, and our understanding of what's looked at. Like, you know, if, if you're continually ranking a program and a project that continuously is underspending their money, continuously not at capacity, um, and dollars, you know, are going back to HUD, you know, the question I would be asking if I'm a reviewer, you know, I'm not HUD, but a question I'd be asking if I'm a reviewer is, does the community, like, keeping an eye on this, should they be, like, rethinking this and looking at this in a different way? And then obviously the performance benchmarks um, and the system outcomes back again to what what um, Josh was talking about is like, you know, are they those all those system performance benchmarks and outcomes? Is this project improving those? Or are they actually a barrier to those? Um, are they meeting their own performance benchmarks? And are they meeting the benchmarks that you as a system have set? For your programs. HUD sets a benchmark, but you as a system can set your own benchmarks as long as they're above what those benchmarks are, right? And then this is one of the things to think about is really looking at the cost per housing exit, permanent housing exit for each project. You can have two very similar projects, but like, and you know, let, looking at the money they come in with, they may have it in their rationale. But again, how many permanent housing exits are we going to get out of this funds, this money spent here versus this money spent here? It's about individuals going to permanent housing. All right. So I didn't, this, the start with the end in mind. Right. So always start with the end in mind. So preparation, that's what I've talked about. Now, starting with the end in mind, what end do you want? So where do you want projects um, and what projects are going to help you get to the end that you have? So these are some values and strategic goals that we really, uh, based on our priorities and what we see in the communities that we and also looking at some past HUD priorities, but a lot of these are things that the Alliance has put out as values that we want each system to look at. So obviously it's reducing the number of people experiencing literal homelessness, but unsheltered homelessness is really, you know, we're seeing some communities are coming in that we're seeing with you know, reduced numbers of unsheltered homelessness, other communities are coming in with doubled um, unsheltered homelessness. So what is it? What's happening? How do we take a look at that? And, and what's gonna reduce those numbers? creating those solid partnerships. We want to make sure these are not just sort of, yeah, we talk to each other, some of these solid partnerships because you can't do it alone. Reducing racial disproportionality and the disparities. Making sure you're helping people with the highest needs, right? And then act with urgency, right? But also with care. But there should, and everything we do, right? There's a sense of urgency. So thinking about that. So starting with the end in mind, and, and uh, Josh talked about this is like, that should say your apologies, we'll correct that for the um, slide set that goes out, but really look at your pit and hit. Like, you know, where's the point in time count? And, you know, so like if you have tons of, of single individuals in your pit, but your hit has very few resources, you know, you have um, 
you know, like 80% of, of your homeless people are singles, but only, you know, 40% of your um, emergency shelter beds are for singles. That's, you know, and, and this is not about funding an emergency shelter, but there's a disparity, but it's the same on rapid rehousing. We know there's a lot of communities that still do most of the rapid rehousing for families, and yet you have mostly singles, and you have, and most of your unsheltered people are singles. So what's going to, what's going to fill those gaps and thinking about that? And then also looking at your system performance over the last several years, you know, and all of you should know those. That's not just for your continued care leadership to look at. If you're getting, if if you're, you know, if you're a provider, if you're um, a grantee, you should really know what those system performance measures are and what are the trends and say, what's my project doing in these trends? Am I able to see for my own project that I'm, you know, um, influencing these trends on a positive impact? And then also what kinds of project types are you going to need to improve those trends? And, and also then coming with that end of mind. So now that you know where you want to be, right, those values, what is it that you want to do by looking at your data, then making sure that your review and rank criteria is specific to those goals. So what I'm saying is that, you know, your tool should be like aligned every single year. You should not be using the same tool year after year. You want a tool that looks specifically at what is it that we want to accomplish in the coming year and where are the projects going to be? So all on there. I'm not going to go through those, but those are the, the what's on this slide are the very things that you want to be asking when you look at that. And then finally, you know, Josh talked about, talked about the, you know, the traffic circle. You want to also say, is this project, is everything, renewal, reallocated, or new project, how is this going to create that system flow? How is it going to keep traffic moving around our traffic circle? You know, don't just add another lane into the traffic circle because all the lanes are backed up because it's not flowing well. Like, first, make sure that flow is going well, right? Another lane is going to, you know, <laughs> For a short time, reduce those other lanes coming into the traffic circle. But if the traffic circle issue is not resolved, you're going to have a, a you know three times the backup because now you have three lanes backing up. All right, and finally, don't do this alone. Making sure you build community. You can't do this alone. So the one thing I want to start as is this whole the the conversation around elevating people with lived expertise. And we talk a lot about it, but I, you know, I still, I still feel like um, a lot of times we haven't thought about it in terms of our partnerships. That this should not be. We have one person that's on our rank and review committee. We have one person on our governance. We need to look across our whole system and start looking at the partnerships across our system, because who knows better what is going to impact our system than the persons with lived expertise that have been in the system or are in the system. So making sure that those partners, that they, these are folks that are coming as partners, not just as a check mark. Yes, we have somebody with lived expertise in this committee, but this is, we're embracing persons with lived expertise as true partners in the whole planning process of what we do. And then you want to make sure that you're partnering to promote racial equity. So as you start looking for you know, new projects or reallocated projects, start really thinking about who are our stakeholders across our continuum? Who's on our governance board? Who are those partners? Are we partnering with people in the community that are going to build equity across our community? Are we reaching out to non-traditional partners that can add some diversity and improve our racial equity? You know, and I was talking to somebody, you know, a number of months ago, and they, you know, they were saying, well, we, we, we just, we don't have many organizations or nonprofits um, that, that have a lot of um, racial, racial um, diversity in our partnerships. And I said, so look outside, you know, are there churches in the community that, you know, that represent the black and brown communities that have a lot of leadership that could be brought to the table? Um, you know, are there some grassroots organizations that not, aren't part of like the, the higher, you know, level people that we all know about, but they're in their local communities doing work. Those are the folks you want to leverage and bring in um, as partners um, to build community. And then looking at your governance board, if you, for example, if your governance, you know, if your, um, if your um, 
homeless point in time count shows that you have, you know, 35% of your people are black and 10% are, are Latino and, you know, 2% are um, Native American. And, you know, I don't know what that adds up to, but then maybe 60% white. Your governor's board should look exactly like that. Like you want to make sure that your governance board reflects the work that you're doing um, and reflects the people that you serve. So be thinking about what are those new partners to bring to the table. And then building community is those partners that we talk about. You need to partner with housing. You need to partner with health care and you need to partner with other stakeholders. And, you know, and we know that last year, you know, in HUD's NOFO, they put some specific partnerships that they wanted you to show that you talked about. But don't wait till that comes out. The reason those were in there is that you need to have solid partnerships and partnerships are not just somebody that comes to a meeting or somebody that sits on our governance board. Partnerships are real partnerships where we're working together um, and developing strategies and funding strategies that address the folks and our neighbors that are experiencing homelessness in our community. So there's written commun uh, commitments. You know, HUD wants you to have written commitments. We, they historically wanted that. We expect that that will continue. But, but that written commitment needs to be, how are we gonna do that? And then start thinking about all of the services. Like what are the support, so supportive services um, that your continuum of care could fund? Um, or that, I'm sorry, that your continuum of care doesn't have the resources to fund, but that others could fund. This is what I try to read in my slides, I get them wrong. So it's better for me just to talk in general. You, what you really wanna be doing is saying, we can't fund all of this, right? Who out there might be able to fund this? Are there some healthcare partners that could pay for some of these services? Um, could there be some services paid for by Medicare? Like start having really robust discussions about how to do that. And then really start looking. You guys have all had an opportunity that was put there. It was a, a mandated um, part of the EHV vouchers. Um, the emergency housing vouchers that came out is that there had to be this memorandum between the PHAs and between the consumer of care. And the PHAs had to work with the consumer of care and, and in terms of coordinated entry to get people referred. This is a perfect opportunity. We know that some of those partnerships um, you know, were the first time partnerships on our really robust partnerships. They've become these really great partners. We know that some already has some partnerships and we're able to build on those and make them stronger. Um, we know that some people are still struggling with those partnerships, but build on what you have. You know, for the first time, there's you, you've come together with your PHAs. If you haven't been able to do that before, most of you have been able to have at least some partnership, even if it was mandated, it's a place to start. And then start looking at expanding other housing options. You know, can we get other housing preferences? How do we work with our PHAs to make sure that we're actively working with them, not just having them sit on one of our committees, but it's an active partner that we're strategizing and building these partnerships. So I want you to remember as so we're, we're winding up this, this, um, this presentation today, remember, Building community is so important. You can't do this alone. I think we know that. I, and, you know, somebody had said earlier um, that, you know, one of the things they're struggling with is that we've got all the components of the continuum, but we are losing so many people that we're just about, you know, to fall apart. It was said much more eloquently than that. Um, but I think we... You're, we can't do it alone. And more than ever, we have got to build community around us. And this may be outside our traditional community. Um, if the traditional partners aren't the ones that we you know, often work with aren't there at the table, let's start looking beyond and, and expanding our community because we all have to own as a community that our neighbors are without housing. And how do we come together and start doing that? And, and just reminding you again, to sum it up, Prepare, right? Be strategic and build community because that's how we end homelessness, right? This is not, you know, yes, we said the NOFO, but this is any time you think about it. And I think sometimes, you know, we say the NOFO and right away we're all here at the table. But I want you guys to step back from this and just have some robust discussions around the table as, as you start going into this and start really thinking about your preparation, about how you're strategic and how you're building that community. Don't do it just because you're going to get a better score than NOFO, right? <laughs> That's the icy to cake. <laughs> but do it because it matters and it's the right thing to do. You have to have the right ingredients to even bake your cake 
or it's not going to happen. So Josh added this amazing picture of this amazing cake. And literally, this is what your cake looks like. It's diverse layers, but they're held together. You know, that's your system flow with that icing. And then the icing on the cake is if, if this is a way that we can leverage some funding, absolutely bring in more funding. But ultimately, you want to build your homeless response system that's effective and it's really efficient and it's equitable. So with that being said, if you have some specific questions, please take this address down um, and um, you can address them to the center at NAH.org. And our team is made up of Josh Johnson, um, myself, and Christy Schulenberg. Um, she is the director of our, our um, Center for Capacity Building. It took me a minute to push that Center for Capacity Building out there. Um, and, and Mia Bryant is part of our team as well. So when you send those questions to the center, they come directly into our team and we will get those open for you. Um, please check your chat. Um, there, are, um, there have been a couple of links put in there throughout it, but go to our system um, page on our, on our website, www.nhomelessness.org. And on that website, um, in the systems page, you will find links to the, the, um, the, the, check, the consumer care checklist that we talked about today. And Josh, I'm going to say thanks so much um, for being part of this with me. And um, go ahead, say one last word. And we're at 2.30 and conclude the webinar. Well, again, I appreciate you. Thank you so much, Kay. Thank you all for your, your energy in the chat. And being here, uh, we are in this fight together. I appreciate all the hard work you all do in your communities. Um, and feel free to re reach out to us and ask questions. We are definitely here to help. So um, thank you and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.